I'm Chris Tinsley, I'm a student here at Sloan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's panel, tackling name, image, and likeness in college sports. On today's panel, we have Jerry Cardinal, founder of Redbird Capital Partners, Saquon Barkley, running back for the New York Giants, Stan Wilcox, executive vice president at the NCAA, and Martin Jarman, athletic director at Boston College. Moderating today's panel is Warren Zola, Executive Director of the Boston College Chief Executives Club. This panel will run for approximately 55 minutes and will include 10 minutes uh, of audience Q&A. You can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag likeness. With that, I'll leave it to Warren. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. Um, the obligatory thank you to the students at MIT, Jess, Darrell, um, and the entire organizing committee. It's a fantastic event. I know how hard these are to pull off, and so uh, kudos to you, and hopefully we'll bring some um, education on the future of college athletics and name, image, and likeness, and I'm thrilled to be joined by such a great panel. It's clear that the landscape within college athletics has changed dramatically in the past 10, ten years and continues to change. There have been major reforms that have happened and that continue to happen, both on the student side as well as on the revenue side. Name, image, and likeness is an issue that has been in front of the NCAA in college athletics for quite some time. And various states now have begun to pass legislation. There's somewhere between 30 and 40 states that have given thought to passing legislation that would provide the rights to name, image, and likeness to college athletes under the NCAA umbrella moving forward. California has passed a law that takes effect in 2023. Florida has passed legislation that either takes place this fall or pending <clears throat> some decisions at the state government potentially a year from now. Clearly, name, image, and likeness is coming to college athletics. It's gonna change a whole lot of how this industry is run, both from the NCAA's perspective and from the college athletes themselves. And we're gonna take a look, not at the past, but where we think these trends are going, what college athletics will look like in the future, what the ramifications are to both the students and to college athletics. And the last thing I'll mention before we get going, college athletics is an incredibly valuable part of an educational system. The mission of institutions is to provide all sorts of learning experiences that are transformational, that cannot occur in the classroom. And college athletics plays a big role of that. And so remembering to tether education as part of their experiences moving forward will be something that everyone's gonna have to grasp, grapple with and understand. So let me start with some basic questions in terms of you all come from very different perspectives. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see facing the industry in integrating this concept of name, image, and likeness under the present scenario of states passing legislation, the NCAA considering how to change and evaluate and understand and protect its, its students? I guess I should start I'll start with Stan. You are the NCAA. Welcome. Sure. <laughs> you are representing the members yes. of the NCAA and have a whole lot of different constituents from Division I on down to Division III and will impact differently across the board. Sure. And uh, <clears throat> just to start off with, uh, I guess I've been a member of the NCAA from very uh, different sides as a student athlete. Uh, then as a uh, starting administrator at the NCAA, then uh, uh, in a conference office at the Big East Conference for several years, and then to uh, my alma mater as an administrator, and then on to Duke as an administrator, and then as an athletics director at Florida State for five years. And now, go <laughs> news. <laughs> and then back to uh, the NCAA uh, as a uh, as a executive executive vice president. So, I've seen and understand how the NCAA works uh, from the inside out, uh, being on all those different sides. And I'd say the, you know, the 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 most uh, critical and and difficult thing uh, is when you have over a thousand institutions um, that are collectively coming together to uh, determine how they want to run collegiate athletics. It's always a, a very difficult thing to get everybody to understand and move in the right direction. So the biggest thing and the biggest hurdles that we run into all the time is number one, the education of the membership, 
and understanding that this, we are not uh, doing away with our principles, our, uh, all the guidelines that we uh, have and hold true to as far as uh, what it means about college athletics and a college athletic experience for student athletes. But we're changing with the times and we have to uh, always look at our rules and regulations and figure out how do we modify those rules and regulations so that it does change with the time. The times right now is really critical because you know, particularly in the social media space, when you have stu prospective student athletes who are coming in with brands that they've already built, whether that's on uh, Facebook, whether that's on YouTube, whether that's uh, on Instagram, and they're building a following where they're hitting targets where sponsors wanna uh, put sponsorships on their pages, advertising, et cetera. And those things are uh, things that every human being, every, every person ought to, ought to have the ability to um, um, take advantage of. So just like the regular student at, a, uh, at an institution, we want to treat our student athletes the same. And so it's, it's just a matter of now figuring out how we modify our regulations so that it accommodates that and it accommodates that within the collegiate model. And we're going to get there. We're, we're, we're definitely on the track. I think we're now at a point where our membership totally understands it a little better and uh, has all agreed, yes, we're gonna make changes in this, in this area. Now we're just at the point of, well, how far are we going to go? And, and I, I think one of the statements that you made is actually needs to be underscored for you to say, you know, we recognize that these students should have the same rights as the other students. And that's not always been the same message that the NCAA has, has come out with, right? And so that, that's a shift. Yeah, and you know, what, what generally is uh, that causes that is uh, because uh, collegiate athletics is not like your other um, athletics organizations, your professional organizations, where they have a, a draft and you're drafted to a particular team and that team owns you. Mm -hmm. In collegiate athletics, we have a recruiting model so that uh, student athletes, uh, prospective student athletes are recruited and given an opportunity to determine what institution they would like to attend. And so we're always trying to protect our recruiting model you know, even though there are, you know, everybody knows that there are violations that go on in that area. If you look at the most violations that, uh, that we have in our industry, it's generally in the area of recruiting. But that's unique to college athletics, and that's something that the membership wants to maintain, and, is, and that's the very, very tricky thing for us to be able to maintain it while also making things a lot more liberal. And, and I'll come back to competitive balance at the college. Sure. landscape in a second. I, Jerry, I want to turn to you. You have started one team. And for those who don't understand sort of the purpose of that, you're coming from, again, a different perspective from the pro side. Tell us a little bit about one team and what some of these changes at the college level are going to mean to what you guys are trying to do as a business model. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, 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 we sort of uh, started our entry into this whole dialogue was from the professional level. <laughs> and it just dovetailed timing-wise with what's going on in college. But, you know, for me, I mean, I've spent 25 years investing around professional sports, uh, and, you know, the, the premise that has worked very well for us over 25 years is to take capital like we have and partner with rights holders and create terminal value businesses in that partnership. That's a win-win. It's a win-win for the rights holder. It's a win-win for the capital. Uh, and, you know, we, we're constantly re-underwriting our perspective on sports. And so the one thing I would say when you, when you get into this discussion is you really got to step back and say to yourself, well, what, what's the value chain here and what's the entry point? You know, we, we started, I started my career on the media side, you know, creating the Yes Network. We went, then went to the infrastructure side with Legends Hospitality. We went and went to the live event itself with on-location experiences with the NFL and the Super Bowl. And now we came to the players. And it's fascinating to me that it took me 25 years to bring capital to labor, mm -hmm. right? It's never happened before. Now, why is that? And the thing is, is that, you know, this, this discussion that we're having here on this panel, you know, it, it immediately jumps into a very micro discussion on name, image, and likeness. I actually step back and I say, well, wait a minute. You know, there actually is an inherent partnership here between the teams and the leagues and the players. They can't have a game without either of them. And what's happened is when you step back and you look at the value chain in sports, you've got the teams in the leagues and you've got the players, and it seems like the teams in the leagues have evolved 
and they've had capital supporting them, and the one-third of the value chain hasn't evolved as much from a business standpoint. Now, you have the overlay in the professional side. You have the overlay of the, of the collective bargaining discussions and all of that stuff. But if you step out and you pull out the economics, the business of sports, what you realize is that there's a starting point here that should precede the discussion on name, image, and likeness, which is that there's an inherent alignment and partnership. The play, what I found on the pro side, which I'm hoping we can actually be helpful in the college discussion with, is that there is actually a very tangible, actionable, and a very receptive audience on both the, the, the owner and league and team side and the player side to find areas where they can partner together. Mm -hmm. So that together, you know, there's, a, there's this notion that also precedes name, image, and likeness, that it's a zero-sum pie. And one of our premises on the pro side is I don't think it is a zero-sum pie. I actually think you can make the pie greater. You can add to it incrementally. Uh, and, and the only way you're going to do that, though, is if the three parts of the value chain come together. It's anti-Darwinian to have two-thirds prospering with capital and one-third not. And that's not a political statement. That's just sort of good business. And so if we can rise this up a bit and, we can, and, and capital can be the lubricant that, that sort of puts these guys together more. That, and again, I'm, I'm saying all of this not naively that there isn't obviously CBA discussions, all that other kind of stuff. I'm saying if you can do this part of it, you can raise the pie for everybody. And the question I have in my mind as I'm just starting to turn my eyes to college is, is that paradigm also applicable to the college environment? So, Saquon, there's been this tension between sort of education and commercialism within college athletics over the years, right? There's no doubt that college athletics is a big business. Multi-billions a year are coming through, not to everybody, but it's being generated. The changes in how we consume media, the media rights deals, everything. At what point during your career did you realize the revenue is being generated from the players <coughs> and that college athletics had put some type of a, a cap on your ability to capitalize upon your brand as an athlete? Um, yeah, I would say it probably took to my sophomore year. Um, when you're a freshman, uh, that's kind of not really going on your mind. Um, you're worrying about getting to class on time um, and trying to make <laughs> it on the team and uh, play well for your team. But uh, as it got to my sophomore year, I started having a lot more success and. Uh, like you said, we said your brand, you can see your Instagram following, you can see uh, yourself on TV commercials, you can see yourself on ads on an ESPN game, and you see that your brand has grew uh, tremendously. So uh, I would say it took me to my sophomore year um, to you know, realize it, but then actually get a true understanding of it. Uh, my junior year, uh, I, I was having a, a, a very great junior season, yep. um, you know, kind of halfway through the season, uh, probably one of the Heisman, probably one of the Heisman guys. Uh, I think I finished like fourth or third. Um, but when you when you see that and you kind of have that mindset that you know that you're going to the next level and you're and you're going to go to the to the NFL, um, those things kind of come come to your mind. And uh, obviously, you know, I, I understand like the NCAA point of view, but um, the way I look at it is, what harm is it, you know, to help those guys, help those players? I know a lot of players um, that you know I, I came in with. Uh, you know, financially, uh, it, it wasn't that great at home. And mm -hmm. um, that little bit of money in their pocket um, is something that they could send home to the mom and the families. And um, I know, like, from, you know, you get your FAFSA checks or you get your stipends. Uh, I know a lot of those guys didn't even see that because they sent that right home to the mom. I was one of those guys. So um, you know, I see myself all over ESPN and stuff like that. Uh, I think it would have been very beneficial to not only myself but my family if I was able to, um, you know, have some of that income in my pocket. So, so Martin, I'll, I'll come to you. I know that you work at a fantastic institution. I can't remember where, but, but thanks for joining us here. Um, you've been, like Stan, you're a Division I athlete. You've worked at a bunch of colleges, including Ohio State, before you came to, to Boston College. What are you hearing from your perspective, both as an athletic director in the ACC, as someone who cares deeply about the mission of an institution, and who has, what are we, 31 varsity sports? It's a broad scope that you've got to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, I think that we're having healthy conversations and it's time for change. Um, mm -hmm. as, as Stan alluded to, you know, I've been pleased to see the educational piece of this kind of come to the, the forefront uh, because at the end of the day, you know, our mission is to educate, develop, and teach. And I do think name, image, and likeness, it allows us an opportunity um, to, to help our student athletes learn and grow and develop in a way that they haven't been able to, 
You know, I look at this as an educational opportunity. Uh, you know, as far as your brand coming in and understanding what works and what doesn't. Um, maybe some of those lessons can be learned um, and we can help facilitate that, uh, but also bettering their situation too. Uh, I, I think that's a win-win. So I, I'm, I look at it from a standpoint that, that we're going to get there. And I think it's a positive thing. And, uh, you know, to Stan's point earlier, you know, it's, it's like when you have a lot of people in the room with different opinions, it's, it's hard to galvanize and, and get everybody to get on the same page when every school looks different. The opportunities look different, you know. Um, and then there's also the education piece where a lot of our student athletes may not understand the impact. Some of our administrators don't understand the impact. I think we've come a long way now to where um, there's more education as far as what it looks like, what it could look like. Uh, but I think it's positive. I, I think this is an opportunity to really um, help young people grow and, and understand their brand, understand how they can monetize that, understand that maybe the market is not what they think it is. You know, uh, I'll give an example. I talked to one of our teams about jersey sales. And, and you know, if, you, if a jersey sells for $60, how much do you think you would get from that? And, you know, I was getting answers $40, $50. And, and then you start listing all the, all the entities that, that got to get, get their cut before you, and it's kind of an eye-opening thing. So, so again, this is an educational opportunity to help young people learn before they get professional and get to, uh, to that real world. And, and, and I think that that's important, but I also think that the, the critics would say, and there's, there's no doubt that I've, I've been one over the years, that this is taking a long time. I testified in front of Congress in 2011 saying, okay, change is coming. We know change is coming to college athletics. There's lawsuits, there's legislators that are talking about this. And the hope was that the NCAA would come together, recognize that, have this meaningful exchange to talk about reform before the legal cases and the legislature put pressure and came up with a system for those of us who love college athletics that none of us would find appealing. And that's the pressure that we're now finding is we now have this clock that's ticking. And what happens if the college athletes in Florida have the rights to their names, image, and likeness under state legislature this fall? And so I think that's been one of the, the critiques. But it's clear that there's a, I mean, the devil's going to be in the details, trying to figure out what does this actually look like. And when you talk about what, what Saquon is mentioning, right, and, and you're mentioning on education. So names, image, and likeness rights come to college athletes this fall, next fall, soon. How are schools, conferences, the NCAA going to now pay attention to the role of agents, right? Because the players are now going to have the right, and at least the NCAA has mentioned that they're going to change some of their rules for access to agents earlier. What does that look like? When does recruitment of athletes to represent them for name, image, like Saquon, you're a high school All-American. Are you ready? at your kitchen table as a junior to sit down and have a conversation with agents who want to represent you as you decide where to go and market your abilities. I think that's where we're heading and that's where we're going to have a lot of friction, I guess, would be a statement. Yeah, I'll, I'll comment on that uh, without question. And uh, the, the one thing that I think we have to also think about is that, uh, you know, the term agent is uh, when, when we speak of that, is sometimes that's, that's thought of as in a, in a narrow way in that uh, we're talking about individuals that represent uh, potential professional athletes, mm -hmm. whereas agents is, uh, is a, a very wide variety of individuals who are financial advisors, individuals who are brand managers, you know, individuals who specialize in the social media space in getting uh, individuals more and more clicks or more and more uh, followers. So when we look at that issue as we try to incorporate this in the whole name, image, and likeness, we can't think of it in, in that narrow scope. We have to think of it wider. Because you know, nowadays, uh, parents are agents. You know, parents are building their, uh, their, their son or daughter's brand before mm -hmm. they even get to college. So uh, I suspect what we're going to be looking at, there are, there are organizations and companies out there right now that, uh, that actually specialize in this area, that specializes in making sure that they uh, know what the market is, what the market rate is for an individual that has 
110,000 followers on Instagram or um, what it is for somebody to be an influencer in social media based upon the number of followers. There, there are individuals that specialize in that. There's also uh, organizations that specialize in making transactions uh, very transparent. And that is you know, very uh, important in, with collegiate athletics, with the recruiting space. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we, as we move down this track, we're going to probably see uh, organizations cropping up that are not just what we would call agents, but they're, they're organizations that are, will make transactions happen, will bring together the ad people, the sponsors, along with the student athletes who have uh, the ability to maybe make a deal with an, an agent, uh, 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 advertising agency or, an ad or whatever. So uh, at this point, I don't, or at least I hope, uh, you know, the NCA is not going to look at trying to do that within house mm -hmm. because that is a, is a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. And and the more that uh, the NCA gets involved in those types of things, one thing that our institutions have to be careful of is that uh, we're not looking for our student athletes to be employees of the institution. And there, because once they become employees of the institution, then we're talking total different laws. We're talking employment laws. Uh, so, uh, so we have to stay away from that. And in order to be able to stay away from that, some of this is going to have to be left open to the free market, and some of it will have to be educating the prospective student athletes coming in. Our student athletes, we that's our business. We have to make sure that we're protecting them from an educational perspective to make sure that they're making the right decisions in who is going to represent them and deal with them in this space. So, so you mentioned a couple of things that, that I want to um, bring to, to Jerry and, and Saquon to, to get their thoughts, right? So there's, there's two areas where name, image, and likeness, well, there's a lot of areas, but, but two sort of main areas. One is group licensing, right? And so, you know, Saquon, you, you were very aware at some point that you couldn't play NCAA football 2017 with yourself as a player as a result of um, the NCAA's rules, right? So now, in, in theory, we're going to have that ability for all of the college athletes to get group licenses so that EA Sports can, can come back at the college level. Are there thoughts, and I know, Jerry, that you guys are thinking about how, who's negotiating on behalf of these athletes for those rights? Because you have the ability as an individual, you're an elite athlete, you're an All-American, there may be a local company, a national company that wants to have you represent them individually, but there's also this group licensing impact that will affect all of the athletes. So, so Jerry, like, what are your plans to do that? And then I'll come to Saquon to get a sense of how that would, that would work from your perspective. You know, look, again, I, 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 um, I need to reset the conversation a little bit because, you know, what I'm finding is that everybody at the pro level and at the college level, everybody's jumping in to this conversation from the existing constructs. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say is that I think people got to stop, s slow down. Obviously, in college, there's a, a lot more players in college than there are in the NFL. I've got 2,000 players that are constituents in the NFL with NFL PA, and I've got 1,500 constituents in baseball. You know, our, our new company, One Team, is anchored by the NFL PA and MLB PA. And MLB PA. Um, but, but what we're finding is, is that, be, you know, and I'm finding this also in college, that, you know, once you get to the college level, it, it immediately goes to name, image, and likeness on an individual level. And that's when you start to talk about agents and you start to talk about individuals. And, you know, in sports, it's the same thing in Hollywood. I mean, there's, there's the 1% and then there's the 99%, right? Mm -hmm. In Hollywood, you've got Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, and then the other 99% are waiting tables, basically. In sports, you've got the breakout stars, but then you, you can't have a game or a team. It's the same concept unless you have a team and mm -hmm. it's everybody. And I think what we should be focused on, certainly at the pro level, uh, and then also I think it even applies more to the college level because college is more complicated, frankly, than the pros. I think we got to look at the collective. And so rather than get into these immediate discussions on NIL with regards to uh, individuals and, and agents and what does that mean, and then it's, it seems like it's just you know, completely out of control, I, would, I think with the, the starting point in the conversation has to be the collective grouping. And I'd have to believe 
I'll, I'll, let me make a, I'll, I'll state something on the pro level that we're finding. Now look, we're two minutes into this, but on the pro level what we're finding is that um, our, our whole investment thesis is predicated around group licensing for all of the players and it's anchored by two verticals, video games and trading cards. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is, is that if we, can, if we can find a way to partner with the other two thirds of the value chain that I talked about, there's a chance to actually grow that pie. Now what you do with that incremental pie is then the next iteration in the discussion. So I would submit to you that you know, in, in college, there, there has to be, a, a, everyone has to pretty much get around and agree that if you could grow the pie, the media pie, the sponsorship pie, the ticketing pie, by having the players participate with the conferences and with the, the, the league, that that's got to be a good thing. Then you can go talk about, well, how do we divvy it up and what does it mean for individuals, et cetera. I, I agree, but here's the question. Who's representing the college athletes at the table when they're talking about growing the pie? Is it the athletic directors in the, in the conferences that say, okay, you're part of us and we're going we're gonna to do this? Are, is there, I know that, that college athletes are not employees based on NLRB's quasi decision or, or punt at the, at the DC district, but is, is there some recognition of we allow some union for group licensing for this or a body that does it, whether it's Ramogi Huma at NCPA now, like Saquon, have, like who do you think should be sitting at the table with you or should the athletes be at the table representing themselves? Mm. Uh, I mean, I definitely would say the athletes, but you also gotta, you know, get in the mindset that we are college athletes and we have a lot on our plate and a lot on our table. Um, so kind of come back to, um, you know, a topic that keeps getting brought up is education, educating those guys. And, mm -hmm. um, we can't just go up there, just oh, what we see on social media or how we feel. Uh, you got to go and do your own research and educate yourself. And then if obviously with the NCAA or athletic directors and your coaches help you out, um, we will be able to go up to that table and, you know, represent ourselves the right way. Um, so I, obviously I think that the, this kind of same way where it is um, with the, with the CBA and NFL, um, having your players and having player reps. Uh, but obviously that's way along the, down the line and we have to have the right people in place and make sure we have the right education system in place for us to be able to do that. Stan, um, you. I'd like to add into this. So, um, so over the years, uh, we've uh, looked at the, the NCA structure. Um, and uh, over the, uh, what we've done is you know the NCA uh, is a very bureaucratic machine, but we recognize that. that we have to have uh, all the various dif different constituencies within collegiate athletics at the table when making new rules changes. So I want to say it was back in 1990, uh, 91, we created back then we realized that we weren't hearing the student athlete mm -hmm. voice uh, when we uh, voted on legislation. We created a, student athlete, a national student athlete advisory committee. And then that has expanded over the years from the national student athlete advisory committee to conference student athlete advisory committees and every institution has student athlete advisory committees on their campus. Um, so so we, we, we figured out a way of making sure that all student athletes had a say in how our rules would change and, and we wanted to, we, want, we needed their voice. We have to have their voice. I think we're, we're, we're up to that point again where, as you say, we got to come up, we got to figure out, well, what is that legal construct to allow student athletes to be able to be represented uh, if they decide that they want to go into group licensing. And that's one of, the, one of the biggest issues right now that the various different committees are faced with and, and with talking about name, image, and likeness. But I do believe that there's a way in which we can create a student athlete, of, uh, for lack of a better term, association, player association comprised of the SAT groups mm -hmm. that would be able to, uh, in essence, represent the student athletes in any negotiations for group licensing. But I don't see that happening until after we get through that first phase, which is really going to be about the individual license. And I, I, you're right, certainly the, the, the athletes have participated in advisory panels, but the framework in which those discussions are happening has changed, right? Yes. I mean, the framework was you can't do any of this. Jerry, Jeremy Bloom tried to change it, Ed O'Bannon tried to change it, and the NCAA had said, no, here's the framework, so we'll listen to you, but within this construct, 
And that's why the law and the legislature have come in and said, okay, this framework has some issues, right? And so I, I, I believe that the students have to be involved, but it's been external forces that have played a role in, in changing that a little bit. Martin, how are you gonna educate the, what do we have, 800 athletes as they move, 750 athletes on campus? Because it's gonna be different. We have a women's ice hockey team that has Olympic players on it. We've got football and, you know, huge range. Yeah, well, with anything, you, you have to start with transparency. You know, you have to in, uh, communicate. I mean, communicating transparency, um, you know, we try to send out articles. We try to, you, you just got to get in front of it and get in front of our teams and our student athletes to help them understand what's being talked about. You know, a lot of things that are going on right now is very fluid. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with change, um, there's uncertainty, but the only thing that you can control is how you communicate and the, the most information you have, you try to, try to share that. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of student athletes and administrators even that don't really, um, haven't had their arms around this. And, and so the more as we move forward um, before the convention in January to educate and get in front of our teams and talk about what does it look like? You know, it's not just a, a YouTube channel. It's not just uh, Instagram followers. Uh, there, there's so many things at the local and national level that this could be. Uh, so as, as, it, as it kind of uh, the conversation matures, which it has, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's evolving thing. It's not, you know, we're not at a place right now where, where this is set and this is how it's going to be. You know, change doesn't happen that way. Um, the way change happens is you continue to talk about it. Different aspects are brought to the table. Uh, you get more voices. You get more opinions. And, and, and student athletes are, are talking at the table now. You know, they're a part of the council now. They're a part of the conversation. So um, collectively, uh, we have to get there together. That's the only way this is going to happen. It is going to happen, but um, you know, educating and communicating and being transparent with, you know, here's here's the deal. This is how professionals like Jerry see it. This is how student athletes see it. This is how administrators see it. This is how the NCAA sees it. And and um, you know, just have those conversations. And we're doing that now. I, I, I just yeah. will say that I think where you where you guys were going is something we should consider, which is you know the experience I've had in sports and then with the pros most recently, uh, is that it is going to require, I think what you were saying, other participants at the table in partnership with the players. Mm -hmm. And what I found um, on this most recent one team experience with the, the league and the players associations is that, you know, really it was, credit really goes to the players associations. They already had, they had, they had divided, they had structured themselves as the players association and then they had players inc. So they had taken the step a while ago mm -hmm. to, to yep. separate out their business interests, and they had people that were working on solely the business interests, and they had people in the PAs who were working solely on the CBA type issues. Uh, and that gave us the framework to then take the next step. Next step was, well, who out there has capital and has business experience that can partner with us on the PI side mm -hmm. at the table when we're thinking through these things? It's very difficult to sort of say to players, you know, just show up at a discussion on NIL and, right. and, and from a standing start. And so and the key, though, is that, you know, the problem in today's world is, you know, there's so much capital everywhere that you've got to sort of step back and say, well, it can't just be the capital. Right? It, you have to look at the alignment, you know, the, the, do we share the same cultural values, do we to share the same you know, prioritization on, on education and, and, and the things that we want to get done on the scholarship front, all of that stuff, again, particularly in college, even more so than the pros, there's got to be a whole other overlay to that, and that's where it gets tricky when you start getting into my world, right? because my world's all about you know, making, making a profit, but it has to bring other elements in there. So I would suggest that there, there has to be a seat at the table in partnership with the players well, yeah, yeah and, and when you think about name, image, and likeness, there's, there's two components to this, right? When you read and you hear what, what Mark Emmert said in front of Congress recently in January, talking about having guardrails to protect the athletes and, and the schools from anything that could potentially happen. But then you also have the other side where you think, okay, we have to work, we're concerned about outside influences, we'll call it, on, on guardrails and protecting our students. But then you also have to figure out, okay, if college athletes have the rights to their name, image, and likeness, how do we ensure that they're able to capitalize upon those rights as well? So you've got these two pressures, right? And so how, how does this, and maybe it's a learning experience, and we're, we have to get there, but when you think about all of the change that has to happen, we've got this clock that's ticking, that, I mean, there's a chance that a couple of the schools in the ACC, if the Florida legislation stays, 
It's supposed to take effect July 1. Have we have, have, at the NCAA level, have you, have you talked about sort of what does that look like if that law passes and is put into place this summer? Sure, we have. Uh, <laughs> what would those and, conversations? And I, and I believe that there are more and more states now that are actually changing their effective dates mm -hmm. to later. Yes. Um, so that that's encouraging, and uh, we are very optimistic that we uh, sh should be able to um, get a congressional bill uh, in place that will preempt the uh, state bills. Uh, if that doesn't occur and it doesn't happen. You know, there's only really two options. You one, either you're going to have chaos because you're going to have certain states that have uh, that are uh, have schools within the NCA that are under different rules, and uh, and then collectively the question will be, will you allow those schools to participate in cha the championship events or not? Um, you know, that uh, you know that's one scenario, and the other scenario is is the the same thing that we're always been faced with over the years, and that is that we would then have to sue, um, bring a lawsuit against this, those states whose bills that go into effect prior to any preemptive congressional bill, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we believe that those state bills are unconstitutional as it, uh, you know, it's not permitting free, free flow of, uh, of, uh, uh, of individuals to be able to conduct business interstate uh, uh, within within states with interstate, so I, I think there's 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 two outcomes there, but uh, but I think we're also obviously optim optimistic that uh, we will be able to get some changes done legislatively within the NCA by April of this year. It will be the, will be phase one, and then uh, January 21 will be phase two. And I think as the states see the changes that will be made, that they will, you know, continue to either move their bills back or, uh, or repeal their bills. And, and there's no doubt that the architects of the California law intended a start date of 2023 intentionally sure. because they never wanted that law to actually take effect. Correct. It was an intent for pressure for people to come together, and to that extent, it's worked. I certainly want to, to take some questions from the audience. There's a bunch of good ones. I'll start with Martin for you. Who's on your socks? And it's the best pair of socks that, that they've seen for the day. So I know that's. It's my, uh, my daughter's. Excellent. Uh, Scarlett and Savannah. Well done. Great questions. Um, let's, let's turn. Clearly, the, these name, image, and likeness changes are going to have an impact on recruiting, right? What sort of impact, you know? Saquon, you're evaluating a school both for your future as a football player, also for your development as a young man to learn. If name, image, and likeness was in effect during your recruiting process, would that have changed your evaluation, how you've approached it uh, in any way? No, nah, not for me personally. The reason why I say that, um, I, obviously, you go to school because you want to play football, but the reason why I chose Penn State because I felt like that God, if, if it didn't work out for me, if I didn't make out make the NFL, I feel like Penn State would give me the best opportunity um, for a career and for the rest of my life. So um, that wouldn't have played in, for a part of me. But I'm, everyone's different. But from my personal experience and what I believe in, um, I would have the same mindset no matter what. How do you think it will, we, we mentioned sort of competitive landscape earlier. When name, image, and likeness is implemented at the college level and every college athlete has that right, how do you think that will change recruiting at the college level in terms of, you know, right now the Power Five get most of the athletes at some of the sports. Will there be shifts in, in that? Will there be opportunities for other schools to, to engage? How do you think it will change at, at the college level? Will it, will it change at all? Martin, Stan, Jerry, any of you? You can start, Stan. Uh, I think it'll, uh, it, it, it may change a little bit, but the, the, and when I say that, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in terms of, you know, again, when you choose a, an institution to go play collegiate athletics, you're choosing, if you do it the right way. Agreed. You know, I, uh, I'm, I'm going back to my <laughs> recruiting days, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, my first decision, I didn't do it the right way. I chose a school because because it was closer to home, because my, I had a girlfriend that I wanted to continue to see, and my parents just brought me this new car, and I thought I was going to be able to take it to school. 
But then when you step back and you, and you do the adult thing, you have to look at what the graduation rates are at that institution. Uh, how, you know, have that, has that coach graduated all his players? Uh, what kind of uh, degree that uh, institution really holds once you graduate and go on uh, if you don't make it professionally, just like Saquon said. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, what kind of experience am I going to have? Am I going to have a great experience at that institution? You got to make decisions based on that. There are those that will make decisions on going to certain schools because they believe that they're going to be able to go there and maximize the most out of their name, image, and likeness. Um, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, normal, I guess that's for some people because that's, that, that's their priority. But, uh, you know, I guess what I would also say is, um, you know, if, if you're really just about the money side of it, you know, that should be, you should be able to have opportunities to go to professional route. You should be able to go to the G League. You should be able to go to some semi-pro league. And that's where you should be going. You have to understand what the collegiate route is about. And if you, if you are about getting your education, then name, image, and likeness benefits, that should be down, way down the list on, uh, on you, as far as your evaluation on what school you would go to. But I suspect there'll still be those that make that decision based on that. Let me piggyback off that real quick. You know, you're, you're also talking about percentages. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it'll change for some, but for most, that's not why you make the decision to spend the next three, four, five years of your life. You know, so I think sometimes we get caught up in that this is gonna impact everyone significantly. This is, this is not gonna impact everyone significantly. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a good point, right? Because we haven't mentioned Title IX and we haven't mentioned um, the impact on women sports. And there are some that will argue that this actually may benefit, well, it's going to benefit everybody in, in some way, but here's an opportunity for the elite women's ice hockey players to go ahead and have a camp or to give lessons in ways that they couldn't before. So it's not just the Saquon Barclays, the Zion Williamson's, that are gonna come in and say, okay, I've got so many followers, and everyone's thinking about this huge deal with whatever, whatever company they want. There's this opportunity for that money to find its way in, in other ways that has been restricted previously. Jerry? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, um, I, I, think, I, I was struck when I first started to get up to speed on the college issue that this has been going on since 1995. And one of the first questions I asked my team was, well, what, what's been going on since 1995 that we haven't seen any, any evolution here? Uh, and I think what we should do on this whole thing, again, the conversation keeps reverting to NIL on an individual level. Mm -hmm. and I think what we should really do is, is let, let, let's start with what we have right in front of us that could actually move this thing along, the first step in evolution. So look at the pro, the thing we, we just did with the pros. We got video games, we have trading cards. Why don't we sit down with the NCAA and say on an NIL basis, mm -hmm. let's go look at video games and trading cards. It's incremental, it adds to the pie, it's not threatening yeah. to any existing constituents in their economic uh, uh, you know, places. Uh, the great thing is, is that when I go in and have negotiations with video game makers, you know, to your point on, on the women's side, you know, we, we anchored this one team thing with, with the NFL, Major League Baseball, but we also proactively added women's soccer, women's NBA, and Major League Soccer, because when I'm at the table with one of the video game makers, I want to be representing all of those leagues. I want to represent all of those constituents. We can do the same thing with college. When I'm out negotiating the, the video, the, our video game, and we, we basically own the Madden video game, I should be sitting down and talking about college. Now, the key is you can't do that in a vacuum. What we should be doing is partnering with the NCAA and saying, hey, do you guys find this of value? Here's what I think. We can, and the starting point on this whole thing, let's add to the pie. Mm -hmm. And then, and eventually, if you do that, you'll be amazed at the progress that you'll start to see. When you, and then you can start to get into all of these other much more complicated issues at the at the at the college level about you know college players, their mm -hmm. you know their individual NIL, how does that relate to the whole, et cetera. But the starting point, you, you got to start somewhere. And the thing, you know, as someone who comes from the private sector, I'm shocked that this thing's been going on since 1995, and here we are in 2020, and we're, we're having the same conversation. So part of what I want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to be a catalyst for coming in guns blazing and, and uninformed, but I would say, you know, the one thing is really interesting, one of the things that I, I thought about is that, you know, at, again, at the pro level, when you look at football, maybe there's an interesting opportunity where we can start to look at vertically integrating the sport. 
So, you know, if we're starting with the pros and we want to have discussions with college, why don't we go all the way down to Pop Warner and high school and talk about the benefits that the whole value chain in football can benefit from by virtue of these activities. You see what I'm saying? And so it's, it's, these things are complicated, and so it's clear that, you know, the obvious point is that it's really complicated and there's a lot of constituents, and, but things get politicized, and the great thing about capital, it's the great depoliticizer. Right? And so that's, I would say, one of the things that should be put on the table sooner rather than later is how do we, st I think everybody on this stage would say, yes, we want to see something happen here. We want to see evolution. Okay, well, guess what? Capital's a great way to do that. It's got to be responsible capital. So let's go have a conversation about what's the first step that doesn't, you know, politicize everything so that you're, stop, you're stuck in the old 1995 dialogue. So, so we clearly have some incremental changes that are happening. We have a lot of mechanics that are going to need to be executed and thought through for uh, name, image, and likeness to come the way we envision it at the college level. But let's, let's go forward five or ten years, right? What does college athletics look like from this perspective in terms of compensation for athletes, maintaining the integrity of the educational component to this? What does, what does college athletics look like in five, ten years? What are we talking about in Sloan? at the SSAC 2030 within college athletics? Stan? Uh, I don't think it looks very much different. Um, you know, whenever we've had some major changes where it was such a big deal, whether it was going to the cost of attendance or yep. whether it was mm -hmm. allowing student athletes to be able to work, um, you know, there was always this uproar of how it's going to change the recruiting. It's going to, you know, uh, further divide the haves and the have-nots. Uh, I suspect that, uh, you know, we will fi we'll figure it out. It will be within the collegiate model, and we will go on just as we have been going on, and, and there will be additional benefits available for student-athletes. And that has been uh, always... The, uh, uh, the goal is to make the student athlete experience the best experience it could possibly be. And to find out, find ways in which you can improve upon that on an annual basis. You know, that, that, was, that was my goal when I was on campus, when I was at a conference office, and now at the NCAA. And so I don't see that changing. We're just gonna end up going to the next big issue that'll come after that, which not sure, but I hope I'm retired by then and I'm out of it. So, but I think it, it looks pretty much the same. But the, the, the understanding of this concept of amateurism has changed over the years, right? I don't, I like to use the term collegiate model. Okay, so, collegiate model. So uh, the collegiate model is uh, big enough to continue to expand. Uh, that's the way I would uh, answer that question. College athletics is about providing opportunities for young people to, to grow and develop and, and become what they want to be. And that's not going to change. Fundamentally, uh, athletics is to support the mission of the institution, and that's education. Mm -hmm. you know? And so um, does technology improve upon that? To Stan's point about we always are trying to improve the student athlete experience. Um, we try to learn from guys that leave, like Saquon, to learn what we could have done differently, what can we do better to enhance that. But at the end of the day, um, the mission is education. And so that, that doesn't change regardless of what these big, big, um, big hairy things that we've got to all come together to figure out. Um, it's still trying to better the student athlete experience. That's what, that's what this is about. And so that's not going to change five to 10 years from now. So you've got the experience now of making it to the next level. Looking back at your college career, how do you wish things had been different? Do you wish they had been different at all? Or were you, was the, the process that, that played out for you exactly had you expected and, and something that you wouldn't change upon? Um, I don't think I would change anything, really. Uh, I think kind of going back to what he's saying, like there's that 1% and the 99%, and uh, I've been very fortunate enough to probably be in that 1%. Um, so would I change a little bit of it? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I think, you know, everything happened for a reason. Um, I learned from it. Uh, now I'm in NFL and living my dream, um, and I'm doing pretty well for myself. So I wouldn't really go back and change anything. One thing I do know is that, like, for that people who are in the 1%, uh, I would love to go back and talk to some of those guys. I know uh, NCAA holds, like, a, an event. I remember when I was going from my sophomore year to a junior year, uh, the people who was, like, projected to go to, like, the first round, mm -hmm. the second mm -hmm. round, 
um, there was like an event where we all would go and uh, just listen. They would try to educate us, and I would love to go back and talk because when you are in that 1%, uh, there's a lot of people when you talk about agents, the financial advisors, the marketing, the managers, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, there's a lot of people that's going to come, and you got to put the right people in position um, because uh, you got to have you're not gonna know how to negotiate a deal. You're not gonna know how to do this and then the third. Um, you gotta hire people for that. And when you hire those people, also hire people that's gonna educate you too. And I think I've done a pretty good job with that so far with my team. And um, every single day I'm gonna continue to learn and learn. And uh, hopefully we improve in the, in, in the college space and I can be you know, kind of a factor in kind of helping that in that area. So Stan, it sounds like Stan, he's going to be at the call, next summit. Bring him back. Year, so. We can make that <laughs> commitment <laughs> problem. Um, we, could, we just had it last week. Yeah, as a matter that's fact. right. And, and, I, and, I, and I do think that college athletics, both NCAA conference and, and individual schools, have done a better job of helping the elite athletes prepare for that next level, to understand what that process is like, to maximize upon their potential, to provide insurance <laughs> for those athletes to be covered in, in some ways. Um, so, so there's no doubt that, that things have changed and the NCAA has heard from their constituents over time as well. Um, I know that the clock is winding down, so let me end with a thank you for the panelists for sharing their ideas, their perspectives on reform in college athletics and name, image, and likeness. Thank you to the audience for listening to us. We'll be available for questions, and thank you to MIT once again for pull, pulling off such a uh, fantastic conference. Have a great day. Thank you.